Hello, students, and welcome back to the History of Public Health. Hope you're all doing well. This week in class, we're going to be talking about oral history. You've perhaps heard this term before, as oral history is quite a popular way of doing historical research. But what is it, actually? What are its premises? How does it work? How is it different from other kinds of history? It's important to address questions like these because this semester, each of you is going to design and carry out an oral history research project, specifically one that looks at local experiences of COVID-19. And so, in the hopes of helping you carry out this project, this week's lectures offer an introduction to the field of oral history. In this first lecture, I want to sketch out the history of oral history for you. Before we get to talking about how to actually do oral history, we need to understand this discipline's foundations, where it came from and how it's changed over the years. So in what follows, I'm going to focus on a number of historical questions like, where did oral history come from? How has it changed over the years? And what's the current state of the field? And what are some of the things oral history helps us do, along with its biggest challenges? So to begin with, where did oral history come from? One could argue that oral history is the oldest form of history because its origins date back to the earliest recorded historical events. In ancient Greece, for example, the historian Thucydides wrote an account of the Peloponnesian Wars that was, as he put it, partly based on what I saw myself and partly on what others saw for me. Yet, despite the fact that all history was at first oral, it was really only in the 20th century that this became a formal discipline. One of the earliest examples of oral history was the Federal Writers Project, a U.S. government-sponsored initiative of the 1930s. Intended to demonstrate the cultural diversity of the American people, this project sent hundreds of interviewers all across the country in search of life stories. One part of the project entailed the collection of the memories of the first generation of free black Americans in the U.S. South. Dubbed the Former Slave Narratives, this project served as the inspiration for folklorist B.A. Botkin's 1945 text, Lay My Burden Down, A Folk History of Slavery. Defending his choice of oral histories as his primary source of information, Botkin explained that, quote, From the memories and the lips of former slaves have come the answers which only they can give to questions which Americans still ask. What does it mean to be a slave? What does it mean to be free? And even more, how does it feel? Around the same time, the Columbia University historian Alan Nevins was looking for ways to inject excitement and passion into traditional professional history, which he regarded as boring and overly conventional. In an attempt to repopularize the field, in 1938, Nevins published a book called The Gateway to History. Its purpose, as he put it, was to inspire other historians to, quote, make a systematic attempt to obtain from the lips and papers of living Americans who have led significant lives a fuller record of their participation in the political, economic, and cultural life of the last 60 years. After the Second World War, Nevins continued to cultivate this new approach to history. In 1948, his university acquired a $1.5 million grant to create the nation's first oral history project. Other universities quickly followed suit, as did the federal government, which in the 1950s and 60s began building presidential archives that housed tapes and other recordings pertaining to the presidencies of Harry Truman, John F. Kennedy, and Lyndon Baines Johnson. In large part, what inspired these pioneering oral history projects was a fear, a fear that in the age of the telephone, people were no longer keeping diaries or writing memoirs. So as to prevent their recollections from being lost, 
oral historians pressed for the conducting of in-depth personal interviews with men of importance. The goal here was to fill in gaps in the historical record, just as letters, journals, and diaries had done in an earlier era. As the famous historian Arthur Schlesinger Jr. put it, oral history would provide, quote, essentially supplementary evidence. What it is good at, he said, is to give a sense of the relations among people, who worked with whom, who liked whom, who influenced whom. Especially in the United States. In the beginning, there was a very top-down focus in oral history. Historians primarily interviewed political, military, economic, and cultural elites. Then came the 1960s, which set oral history on a very different path. It was in this decade that oral history really took off. The spark that lit the fire was the civil rights movement. As minorities of all sorts fought for expanded rights and freedoms, activists raised questions about the traditional subjects of historical inquiry. History, they argued, was about much more than the deeds of elite white men. Responding positively to these calls, oral historians believed that their methodologies would give a voice to the voiceless. Believing that they could democratize history, they saw themselves as forces for social change, and they conducted oral histories focused on the disempowered, the marginalized, and those whose stories had been left out of the historical record. From this came several important texts documenting long ignored aspect of the country's history. One important example was Alex Haley's autobiography of Malcolm X, which was published shortly after the civil rights leader's assassination. So too were women's historians receptive to the new potentialities of oral history. Much of the early focus here was on interviewing women involved with the suffrage movement of the early 20th century. At the University of California, Berkeley, oral historians interviewed the famous suffragist Alice Paul, while another initiative called the Feminist Oral History Project conducted interviews with lesser-known rank-and-file members of the suffrage movement. As its practitioners realized, oral history was great at recovering the daily experiences of everyday people. In 1977, Sherna Gluck, the founder of the Feminist Oral History Project, wrote that, quote, Refusing to be rendered historically voiceless any longer, women are creating a new history using our own voices and experiences. We are challenging the traditional concept of history, of what is historically important, and we are affirming that our everyday lives are history. By the 1970s, it was clear that oral history was becoming more of a bottom-up enterprise. Increasingly, the goal was to tell the stories of those ordinary individuals whom historians had ignored. Instead of interviewing famous generals, political leaders, and corporate elites, Oral histories now dreamed of producing a history from below, a history of the ordinary and the everyday, specifically of the working classes, women, children, and racial and ethnic minorities. There was an idea that this was a pure version of history. As many argued, it was now possible to get history straight from the horse's mouth, no longer needing to rely on what elites said about everyday people, Oral history went straight to the source. But as the field became more and more popular, a backlash against it emerged. Some believed that recounting the lives of ordinary individuals was pointless. Among them was historian Barbara Tuckman, who argued that oral history enabled what she called the artificial survival of trivia of appalling proportions. We are drowning ourselves in unneeded information, she declared. For one of her more blistering critiques of the field, see the quote on the screen here. Tuckman's elitist criticism of oral history was a fairly widespread one in the 1970s. Others argued against oral history on the basis of its subjectivity. The criticism here goes as follows. 
Because memory is fallible and changes over time, oral history is inferior in terms of its documentary evidence compared to traditional printed sources which are unchangeable and thus objective. Lots of academic historians believe that as memories can be distorted by things like age and nostalgia, they cannot serve as the basis for reconstructing the past. Initially, in response to these criticisms, oral historians developed tools for assessing the reliability of a person's memory. Borrowing from psychology, they developed techniques for identifying bias, for detecting fabricated memories, and for scrutinizing the accuracy of people's retrospective statements. They argued that just like other historians, they were detached, dispassionate observers who produced an objective account. They used their skills and their knowledge to discover how many facts and how much truth there was in what people were telling them. In the 1980s, however, oral historians gave up on this idea. They did this because they realized that the subjectivity of memory is actually a good thing. One of the first to come to this realization was Michael Frisch, who argued against the idea that oral history was supposed to provide a pure sense of how the past really was. Instead of this, he argued that memory should be not just the method of oral history, but also the subject of oral history. In focusing on memory, he argued, oral historians could open up new avenues of historical investigation. They could address new questions about things like the relationship between memory and personal identity, the relationship between collective and individual memory, and the relationship between past and present. By the early 1980s, many oral historians had become critics of the idea of objective history, and instead they celebrated subjectivity. They realized that oral history interviews were a different kind of evidence than that contained in traditional archival printed sources, and they scrutinized their recordings and their transcripts for what they revealed about the cultural construction of memory. They asked questions like, what does an interview tell us about how people understand the past? What do we learn about the subject's view of themselves as a historical actor? What do we learn about how history lives on in the present and about how the present informs people's views of the past? The new buzzword in the field was subjectivity, as the oral historian Alessandro Portelli put it. In this view, the truth of history was not to be discovered in the facts or events of the past. In this view, history itself was a cultural construction, and as such, what was of interest was not the facts of someone's past experiences, but their experience of experience. Grand master narratives were gone. All there was was stories full of ambiguities and subjectivities. Data was interpretation. Interviews were not about gathering the factual aspects of a person's life, but about drawing out forms of cultural identity. Oral history was about using the language of an interview to understand the subject's subjectivity, whether it be memory, ideology, myth, consciousness, identity, desire, or something else. These trends have continued right up to the present day. Today, oral historians are no longer concerned with analyzing interviews to see whether they contain true or false statements about the past. Instead, they read interviews to see what they reveal about how the past is used to construct people's social identities, or how meanings are made out of memories. As oral historians, we no longer care whether a person's memories have been distorted or contaminated by the passage of time. We assume this, and we ask, why are things distorted or contaminated in a certain way? What purpose do they serve? All right, that's enough for now. Thanks for listening and watching. I have some questions for you all to think about, and I'd really be interested in seeing your reactions, your responses to these in our discussion board. See you all later. Be safe and be well. Bye-bye.